Our precious Father, we thank you in Jesus' name this morning for this time that we can be together as the people of God. Thank you, Father, for your work. Your word says that it gives light to those who receive it. Thank you that your word runs very swiftly. Thank you that your word can never be bound. That's what your word says about itself. We give you praise this morning that the word's going to run swiftly into the hearts of God's people. We're going to receive it with joy. And thank you, Father, that this morning we're going to know again that our God is limitless. No limits to our God. And we give you praise in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Praise be unto the Lord. Now, the message for this morning, we just did the Afrikaans one. Man, I tell you what, we had a time online. Those of you who were on the Afrikaans service as well, we had a great time. And we spoke about the fact that God is limitless. We are limited because of our confines in this natural space that we are finding ourselves in right now. And we are going to just look at a couple of things before we start. For instance, now, you know, I always have my water bottle with me when I'm preaching, just in case. Yeah, I know. I think I got this one from my wife because I know it's a lady's color, guys. Uh, oh, there it is, 500 mils. I said in the Afrikaans service, I wasn't sure if it was like 500 or more closer towards 700. But the fact is, they've got it on the bottle. That's the limitation. So whatever I put in the bottle, it's not going to make any difference because the capacity of the bottle is 500 milliliters. So I'm not going to extend that because that means that the cap will not go on. That's the way it was manufactured. That's the way it was done. That's the way it works in this life. But I'm, I, I don't like to use the phrase, I'm afraid to say, I don't like to use that. So I'll say, but I have to say <laughs> that we've been so programmed by this world system. This past week, I've spoken to one or two people, and even my wife and I had a discussion about this yesterday, when I said to her, isn't it amazing how when you look at the world system, if you look at the people of the world, and things that are coming to light now that we never knew, we just never knew it because we were always in obscurity, uh, as far as that is concerned. We were always like under wraps. We, we didn't see any of it. We were closed in. We were limited. And what we are seeing come to light now, I mean, Desiree said a thing yesterday. She says, but isn't it amazing? I mean, for how long have we been left in the dark with things? Now that things are coming to the light and we're saying, oh, but hang on, this is really what's going on. But hold on, it's been going on for decades, centuries. So then you think about how we have to really discipline ourselves in changing our thinking, changing our reasoning uh, capabilities in that sense of linking it up with an unlimited God. Now, in our finite mindsets, in our limited mindsets, we are so conditioned by a world system through the five senses, through what we see, what we hear, what we smell, what we taste, what we feel. All of that has been programmed into our subconscious, and we live our lives according to the framework of those references. And cognitive choices are made from the subconscious based on experience based on what you've done before, based on what you've seen before, based on what you've decided before. So, so basically, in a sense, we are living extremely limited. And when I thought about that, I thought it's so, it, it's so akin to our daily lives, because if I get in my car now and I drive across to the airport, for instance, I'm going to have to make sure that I have sufficient fuel for the distance. Now, I kind of understand the capacity of my vehicle and how far it can go on a tank of fuel. Although now with the prices of fuel, that is completely off the log, really, in what we are paying for fuel in South Africa. And you put fuel in the car and, you know, okay, I've put in, <laughs> you put in 500 now, doesn't take you too far. But I know that, I have a limit when I put that in, there's a limit to how far I can travel. So and the reason I'm saying this is because our conditioning is according, listen to this, is according to limitations. Our conditioning is according to limitations. But if we live according to the limitations, 
we won't see the hand of the limitless God. Woo! I need to say it again. If we live according to our mindsets and our limited views on things, we are not going to see the hand of the limitless God in our lives because we won't recognize it. That's why God has had this thing with these people from the word go, the Israelites from the word go. We're going to read a portion of scripture about that just now. And I need to also bring in the, the age thing here. You know, at the age that you are at right now, you are in a limited time space continue, well, in a time space uh, uh, dynamic. God is in a limited uh, uh, continuum. So our lives are so confined in this space, then God comes in, he speaks to our hearts, he shows us his limitlessness, he shows us the kingdom which is limitless, and then we've got to kind of go through a mindset, adaption, transformation, change, so that we can start seeing what he sees. So when you look at scriptures, for instance, that says that we've been translated out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of the son of his love. So you are in a kingdom this morning where you are seated in your home. Physically, you are positioned on this earth. Spiritually, you are seated in heavenly places. You are here physically. You are here practically. But spiritually, you are seated in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. How awesome is that this morning? But now for you to think about that daily, for you to actually live that out daily, is quite hard because your head is so much in control. That's why we, and I'm, I'm saying my wife and I, have, have, have uh, applied ourselves over the past, it's going on for 30 years, in helping God's people to not live from here any longer, but to live from your heart, to live from the reality of who you are in the kingdom. But you know that when you start aging, because there's a limit, maybe some of you, I don't know what your prospects are. I don't know what your desires are. Maybe some of you want to live up to 120, 130. I don't know. I just want to say that in this time that we are in now, excuse the doggies because this has just arrived home. So, in this time and space that we are in right now, we cannot see usually beyond that. So our own mindset is now limited. We've got a rounding off that. That's basically it. And we plan everything towards that. You say you want, but that's life. I get it. Absolutely. Since sin, sin came in, that's life. But now what about... When you look at your health, now I have to go there this morning because this is so true to me as well and true with me. And I see it all the time. When you were a younger guy, the man of it on, on Lainus for Ochend, when you were here age 25, 26, 27, I mean, you were you were in your prime. You know what I'm saying? I, I remember being in the gym. And, and when I was a young boy, I used to do a whole lot of sport. I used to jog six to seven Ks a night when I, when I, when I, um, just before my parents got home, I would go for a jog. I did judo at that time. I did wrestling. I did a bit of boxing, not too much of that. Uh, I did the field events, discus, uh, um, long jump, high jump, javelin. Those were all my, 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 uh, the events that I so loved and enjoyed. When I go to Joburg, there was none of that. So I went to gym. Then I thought, okay, I'm going to push weights. And I absolutely loved it. And the guys that helped me, and they, they showed me, and they saw a lot of potential, and they pushed me too hard that today at my age where I am now, <laughs> the joints know about it. I'm not being negative. I'm just saying that's just as a result of pushing too hard when I was 26, 27 years old. You see, because you just load the weights because you're a manier, you know? <laughs> you're one of the mana, you know, you're going to prove something. And then you find out that when you get older, that your body has limits. Now, when you pick up things, you've got to be a bit more careful. <laughs> and you carry things around and you know about it the next day. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Why? Because there are limitations. When we look at these limitations, guys, you know, it really takes, it takes discipline to get yourself into the place where God can really bring through to you the reality of limitlessness. When I was sitting going through this, and I love 
you know, putting messages like this together, it's like my ultimate, it's like so, because you go into the word of God, and you go through the pages, and you, you've got to limit yourself, and I said to Annabelle this morning, I said, you know what, I, I, I look at these scriptures, and I go, oh, I've got to limit myself, I can only talk about this, oak, that, oak, and that, oak. that's it, but you look at a Gideon, when it comes to limitlessness, here was Israel, they were in a place that was a bad place, where they found themselves on a regular basis because of the fact that they would come up against God, sin against God. They would want to be like the other nations. They would import idols, bring in the other things from the other nations, and they thought God would be okay with that, and he was never okay with that, and he's still not okay with it today. And they would go along and do these things, and God would say, all right, I have to raise up a nation in order to discipline my people. And God used to do that right throughout the Old Testament. I said to the Afrikaans group this morning, if we have to count the times that God did that, where he took his people, and we'll say in Afrikaans, and in, in, in where he had to discipline his people, he brought in another nation to come against his people, to discipline them, to come back to God. So that's the way he did it. He did it like that every time. So, at this time, it was the Amalekites. They would come every year, and they would steal the produce. They would steal the harvest off the land that Israel had cultivated. But they did that year after year after year after year. How many of you know that eventually, if that happens the second year, you think, okay, well, maybe uh, I can still kind of handle this. The third year, you're going to start getting a little bit demotivated. By the fourth year, you're going to be totally depressed. By the fifth year, you're going to be in a state of oppression. Because they would take the animals as well. You've got to basically start from scratch every single year. How many of you will be able, come on, let's put ourselves in that position. How many of you would be able to deal with that emotionally? You and your family. And when the harvest comes and everything is there, it gets taken away from you. And God allowed it. God allowed it. But there was one guy by the name of Gideon. What God did is he placed something on the inside of him. Why Gideon? I wonder if you thought about that as well. Who come Gideon? Why? Why not a mighty warrior in Israel? He chose Gideon, who was the least <laughs> of his family. In other words, he was the Swartzkop from his family. He was, he was basically, a, in a sense, a nobody. How many of you know God takes the lights in the nobodies to make them somebodies? So God put something on the inside of Gideon, Gideon, just a little seed. God just plants it there. And Gideon takes the seed. He takes the potential that's in the seed, and he starts doing something that nobody's doing. He goes into a place that's unfamiliar for the project because the place is not built for that particular thing. He goes into a wine press, and he treads out corn so that he can feed his family and he can feed those of extended family. And he can start feeding the people of the nation. How big was the nation at that time? We don't know. But at that particular point in time, God had instilled with, listen to this, with, within Gideon, the potential to make an impact and a difference in a nation that was depressed. Imagine a nation depressed. Never mind a couple of people. Guys, just hold on for a second, please. Just hold on for a second. Sorry, guys, it was just a little bit of a disruption here. Yeah? Quickly, I had to deal with that. So God already placed within Gideon what was required, what was needed for him to now make an impact and a difference in the nation. How many people does God need in order to come into a nation and turn it the upside, well, the right way up, because it's all upside down at the moment. He needs one person that will grab a hold of what God is doing on the inside and then do that that's why when god spoke to gideon he spoke to him about his potential not his position Woo, glory listen to this again when god spoke to gideon he spoke 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 <laughs> he spoke to him about his potential not his position 
Because what we do through our limited thinking and reasoning is we look at our positions instead of our potential. And I said it to the Afrikaans people. Some of you know me better than others. If you're going to sit with me and we're going to have a cup of coffee and we're going to have something nice and we're going to have a chat, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to challenge you on where you are at in your life if you are just basically in a rut because a rut is an elongated grave. I'm going to challenge you because of the potential that God's placed on the inside of you. And I'm going to ask you, what are you doing with it? And the reason I've got the right to do that is because not only are you a brother and sister in Christ, but you're also a friend. And friends help friends. And the reason I can talk like this is because I've been there. I was programmed by the world system to think in a certain way. And I thought I was going to be a technician for the rest of my life. And God said, uh, sir. And God stepped in. He placed something on the inside of me. And he says, now I want you to develop that. And I started developing that. And then I found out, but that runs and spills over into the next thing. And that runs and spills over into the next thing. And, and so you carry, and then you realize eventually, but my goodness, I am not, I am not, uh, 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 I'm not a monotype. I'm stereo, <laughs> quadraphonic. <laughs> I, I can do more than just that. Because God had already placed that on the inside of you. In the Old Testament, the Bible talks about the fact that the artisans, the guys who worked with their hands, the craftsmen, God had placed on the inside of them the ability to work with the tools. Here's the thing. God still instills the tools on the inside of you before you have the tools in your hands. Are you getting this this morning? Are you grabbing a hold of this? So Gideon then rises up and God gives him only 300 guys. God wants to show them limitlessness. He showed them their limited reasoning and their limited capacity by bringing in his limitlessness into a nation to destroy a nation. To, to uh, an Afrikaans is it so mooi. Om hulle te verslaan met 300 man. That's all that was required because God never, <laughs> never needs a majority. God never needs a majority. He just needs you to rise up and say, I'm going to do something about this. God has given me the ability. I've got the time. I've got the faith. I'm going to rise up. Moses is caught between the Red Sea and the Egyptians. Pharaoh and the Red Sea. A lot of complaining, moaning Israelites, hundreds of thousands of them. Some say a couple of million. They're complaining and moaning and groaning in the ears of Moses. They're complaining and moaning and groaning in the ears of God. Because what has happened to the Israelites is they came from limitation. Now they're in liberation on their way to the promised land. God has showed, showed them limitlessness in the fact that, come on, you got to realize that after walking a couple of years with the same sandals and it's not wearing out, something's happening. Somebody's in charge of all of this. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> Your clothes. Don't wear out. You guys know, ladies, especially you. Your summer cupboard. <laughs> your, your summer selection. <laughs> now that summer is coming. Then you're going to put the winter clothes away. And you know, just like I do, you're going to take out your summer clothes. And this doesn't fit anymore. And that's not your style anymore. And you got to get rid of it. And you're going to see that something that you kept for a while and you really thought you're going to wear it again has been worn out a little bit. And, you know, it's not going to be great wearing that in public. So you get rid of it. Hey, our, our winter and our summer cupboards, Israelites at the same stuff that they were wearing. And they just kept it. And God kept it clean. God kept it fresh. Why? Because he is limitless. In their limited reasoning, in their limited thinking, God showed them in the desert, this is who I am. If you are off this good and this well right now, guess where I'm taking? You're going to be, oh, you're going to be treated in the promised land. And what did they do? Moaning and complaining and groaning against the leader and against the leader's God. And what they did is, they went back to default in their own minds, you see, because their minds were so programmed by the Egyptians to think limitless, excuse me, to think in limits. 
want to say that again. The Egyptians formulated and programmed the Israelites to think in terms of limitations. To the extent that the Israelites said, we'd like to rather go back there. At least we had the nice food every day. Limitations with nice food. Instead of being limitless and eating food from, from heaven. There was nothing wrong with that, by the way. The Bible talks about that. The, the, the manna in the morning, it was like it, it made from coriander and, and it was sweet to the taste. In the evening, God gave them, gave, gave them protein. By the way, that's just a good thing in health. In the mornings, you have your carbohydrates. Not too much of that, by the way. You have your carbohydrates. You have your food to give you energy for the day. In the evening, you have protein just to fill up again. It's just to restore and replenish. God's awesome, isn't he? Even thinks about that. So they were limited in their reasoning. And God had Moses now in a limited space, in a limited place. How many of you know God loves those things? Where everything is limited, God says, okay, now I can do something here because now you are in a place where you cannot get yourself out. Now I'll do it for you and I'll show you my mighty hand. And Moses reaches out his staff and it wasn't a question whether the sea was going to open. That's how wide. Because <laughs> that's how God works. How wide it's going to open. And they walk through. Joseph found himself in a very confined space, in a pit. A pit is not a place for projection and, and programming yourself for an awesome prospective future. A pit is a very limited place. And God revels in it. And God says to Joseph, all the way through from the inside of him, I am with you. I am with you. God's on the inside of Joseph. Why? Because it's a plan. There's a purpose. And God's plans and purposes are always greater than ours. And God works in Joseph's heart. And God moves him from there. Yeah, you're on from there. He goes into the, into the palace. He goes into prison and all of Yeah, we know all of that. But God took a Joseph from a limited place into a limitless place. So that those who were limited could come to the limitless one who was, who was connected to the kingdom of God, who could show them the limitlessness of God. The unbeperte God is what Joseph for his brothers and his family said. So in the end, who gets all the glory? God gets all the glory. So now I'm going to ask you today, you know, with every message, with every message, there is a challenge. So the challenge to you this morning, where you are at in your personal life, you could be in a place that you are saying, look, I'm, you're uncomfortable where I am. Or you perhaps even say, Lord, to him, Lord, I'm comfortable where I am. Thank you for what you've done for me. Thank you for where I am. Thank you for uh, my life. Thank you for this place where I'm just at peace. And that's awesome. That's great. I want to ask you this question. Are you completely fulfilled? I didn't just ask for fulfilled. I'm saying, are you completely fulfilled in your life right now where you are seated? Listening to this message this morning on the 14th of August. And if the answer is no, if you're not completely fulfilled, which means there's something that's still left undone. There's something you haven't done yet. There's something that God placed on the inside of you where you have the potential, but you haven't made it a project yet. The difference between a dream and a project is a dream doesn't have an ex, uh, uh, expiry date. A project has. Those of you, and I know some of you online, you're in project management. I was in project management myself. So I know what I'm talking about. When it comes to a project, he puts a file on your desk. He says, this is the starting date. It's got to be commissioned at that date. There's no quarreling about it. That's what the company wants. You've got to commission the system at that particular point in time. So listen to this, guys. God comes in from his limitlessness to bring his potential of who he is to the inside of you so that you can move forward in the plan and purpose of what he has for you. I'll never forget Dr. Miles Monroe, the late Dr. Miles Monroe. I had the privilege of meeting him personally when he was in South Africa many, many years. I'm talking about possibly. Uh, about 20 years ago, I had the privilege of meeting him at this meeting where he had this conference 
where Dr. Miles Monroe preached a sermon that I've never forgotten because he made a statement in that sermon and he said this. He said, he asked the question, he asked the audience a question, where is um, or where are the healthiest places on the face of the earth? Some of you have perhaps heard this. Let us video about it now. Where are the wealthiest places on the face of the earth? And, you know, we were all sitting there thinking, I was thinking, well, you know, perhaps the, the oil fields of the East, um, the Middle East, uh, you know, some were thinking perhaps the diamond fields of Botswana, the gold fields of South Africa, the whatever, whatever, uh, platinum mines. What? So, so we were all in our minds thinking now, where are the wealthiest places? And he made the statement, he says, the wealthiest places in the earth are all the cemeteries. Now, of course, when you say something like that, my mind, my mind goes racing. I thought, Dr. Munro, what are you talking about? He says, the wealthiest places on the face of the earth are the cemeteries, the graveyards. And he, he paused, like I'm pausing now, so because everybody's thinking, and he says, because in the graveyards, the way he talks, in the graveyards are buried. Books that were never written. Artworks that were never painted. Companies that were never started. Projects that were never initiated. It hit me so hard that I realized from that sermon onwards, I cannot have any more excuses of what I'm not doing but to lock into the potential that God has given me to start exploring possibilities instead of having limited reasoning and limited thinking, then going on to the side of God, looking through his eyes at me and seeing what he put in me so that I can go from there, use the seed and produce fruit for the kingdom. Did you get all of that? So, so here's the challenge now again for you. Where are you at in your life? But you are not fully fulfilled because... If you're not feeling fully fulfilled, <laughs> it is because there's something God has put in you that is just laying dormant. It's still a seed. You need to plant it. Holy Spirit will water it. And you need to produce from that place. Get out of limitations. Well, Johan, how, how old was, was Moses when God let loose? through him into the world to work through him only 80 years old you look at these guys you look at many of the people that god used some of them were youths like a david others were much older it's so easy to put limitations and vice grips on our minds and clamp ourselves into places of confinement And God's got nothing to do with that. Not at all. Because if you read, if you've got your Bible with you, in Psalm 78, go there quickly, please. In Psalm 78, in verse 40, if you haven't got your Bible, just write the reference down. Psalm 78, 40. How often, talking about the Israelites, they defied and rebelled against him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. And time and time again, as what the Bible says, they turned back and tempted God, provoking and incensing the Holy One of Israel. They remembered not, oh, you just by a said, they remembered not seriously the miracles of the working of his hand nor the day when he delivered them from the enemy. And when, when I was reading that again yesterday, I looked at that verse, verse 41, and I remember just a short while ago, when I preached, I preached a sermon, basically based on what I just said. And I want to show you this in Hebrews chapter, again, write the reference down. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 37. Listen, for yet a little while, and he who is coming will come and will not delay. Now the just shall live, come on, say it with me, 
Come on, you know scripture. Come on. The just shall live by exactly Barry faith. The just shall live by faith. It's from Romans 117. But if anyone, this is God speaking, if anyone turns back, draws back, my soul, God says, has no pleasure in him. Now, I don't know about you, but I think that's extremely serious. So why was God upset with the Israelites? Why was he upset with an entire generation? 40 years. Why was he upset with them? Because of this one thing. You go study it. You'll find it comes to one conclusion. All of that equals, here it is, underlined. They limited the Holy One of Israel. An African Bible that for ochtend gelees. I hope you saw it. It just says there. Hulle het God se krag vergeet. So when we look at the limitations that we place on ourselves, what I'm saying to you this morning and what I'm saying to myself because I'm preaching to myself is that God is not pleased when we put him into our limited mindsets. Then with that, I want to ask you, uh, what are you trusting God for this morning? What are you personally in your own personal life, where you are at now, what are you trusting God for? Well, I'm trusting him for this and, and for that and for that and for that. I, I, I've realized that when you come in with that request, with that desire, he puts the desire there, by the way, then you bring the desire back to him. That's just how it works. It originates from him. Then you bring that desire to him is that he wants to be your all and your everything in that desire. It has to be him first in absolute or absolutely all of that. He wants to be the central focus of where he's taking you. That's why God got the glory for a Gideon taking 300 and defeating the Amalekites. That's why God got the glory for a Moses reaching out his staff over the sea, the sea opening, the Israelites going through. Who got the glory? On the other side, it was evident who got the glory because Miriam took the tambourine and she was dancing with the people of Israel and they were rejoicing in their God. The horse and the rider was thrown into the sea. Your enemies are nothing for God at all. My encouragement to you this morning is get rid of those limitations. And I say to the Afrikaans group, and the Lord's reminding me now by his spirit, that it's amazing how people who are close to you can limit you. Precious family, precious relatives, lovely people. We love them. <laughs> but they sometimes love to put limitations on you. Boundaries. Oh, but that's not who you really are. I have found that I've got more adventures in exploring things that I thought I couldn't do than things that I knew I could do. I, I don't know I had that potential. God put it in me. And then when I started thinking about it, doing it, and I thought, okay, the thought also came from him because I was thinking what he put in there is obviously from him. So the thoughts I'm thinking was from him to actually start initiating it and then making something of it. That's why when, 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 I, when I sit with you and we have something nice to, to enjoy, a cup of coffee or a cappuccino preferably, and we, we sit and we have a chat, we're going to talk about these things. And, and I, and I want to say to you, I've put my hands into so many things. You, you say, well, are you, uh, uh, you know, jack of all trades, master? No, don't, don't go there. You try it out. I've tried things and I go, that's obviously not for me. I'm not going to go there again. Because I had no inclination, I had no drive, there was no motivation, there was no inspiration, there was no expertise in it, there was no know-how. And then I left and I thought, that's just not for me. Then I lock into this thing and I cannot stop. What are you busy with right now that you know is only fulfilling partially what God had called you to do? One of the turning points when you look back on your life, you'll find there are turning points. I call it pivotal points. There are pivotal points or turning points that you've had in your life, all over your life, right throughout your lifetime, you've had them. They're there. One of them for me was, some of you, just some of you perhaps have heard from the time that I shared of Uncle Fred Coombs, who was from Australia. 
He was from Australia, mate, and I love the accent as well. <laughs> he spoke the Australian accent perfectly, mate. And Uncle Fred, when I met him, um, guys, I, I thought about it this morning as well in the other service. I think he must have been about 70, excuse me, 87, 88. At the age of 80, Uncle Fred went back to Bible school. 80. He did two years of Bible school from 80 to 82. And when I used to visit him, I would sit at his feet on the carpet and listen to him. He would have his cane next to him and he blessed me with that cane. And he would sit, uh, I would sit with him and he would just speak words of wisdom into my ears. I would listen to an elderly gentleman who had gone through life, many experiences, and would always come back to the goodness of God. And the one day when I was sitting in front of him there, he reached out his hand to me, put it on my shoulder, and he says, son, he actually said, pastor, I want to say something to you. Never stop studying the word of God. That was Uncle Fred. Then he called his wife. Her name was Esther, Auntie Esther. He called Auntie Esther over. Auntie Esther came and says, please go to my cupboard. At the bottom of the cupboard, there's a box with papers in. Please bring it here. Auntie Esther went. She brought the box of papers. It was a typing box that you buy the paper for the printers. One of those red and white ones. Inside there were all his notes from Bible school. And he said, Pastor, I want you to have this. I said, Uncle Fred, but you, he says, no, I want you to have it, my boy. Because I want you to glean from there and learn from there and use whatever you need for your sermons and whatever it is that you want to do with it. And I took Uncle Fred's box of Bible school notes, all his assignments from there, and I started working through them. That was foundational of many of the things that worked towards the glory of God in the ministry that God had called me to. What Uncle Fred did and what he constantly showed me was limitlessness. And I was the one who had the privilege of marrying him and Auntie Esther at age 85, whatever it was. I married them. I did the, I did the service. But I also had to bury him. I was also the one who did the funeral. That one was very hard for me to bury Uncle Fred. And Uncle Fred had such eloquence in the way that he spoke. He had such a command of the English language, being a journalist in Australia. He formulated his sentences like, I had never heard a man speak lies like that. I've heard it on... Of course, on social media, you can hear these people, but never live. That's why I would, I would hang on to his lips when he spoke. And when I did the funeral um, page, the, the little booklet, I wrote on the front there, the man who could paint with words. That's where I got it from. It's the man who could paint with words because Uncle Fred had no limits. Uncle Fred lived limitlessly. Our last example this morning is a man by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord of heaven. The Lord of glory. The great I am. Seated in heavenly places next to his father. Creator God. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 1, without him was not anything made that was made because the worlds were created through him. Seated at the right hand of his father. And his father says, son, it's time. And here the king of glory, the great I am, the one who was, is, and is to come, the almighty, confines himself into an earth suit in the womb of a Jewish young girl. To be born as a man into the world. To come and redeem mankind from sin in all its forms and manifestations. Where God, God limited himself 
for a period of 33 and a half years in order for a vision to be fulfilled that was prophesied by him from the beginning because he said Jesus Christ was prophesied, excuse me, crucified even before the foundation of the world. When we read in Philippians, and I, I want you to go there with me, please. Philippians chapter 2. Again, if you don't have your Bible, please just write the reference down. Philippians chapter 2. Thank you, Jesus, for your word this morning. Are you learning something from this? Are you getting something from this? Is this helping you? Are you feeling encouraged to go that, not just the extra mile, to go another mile, on another route, in another place, with something different? In chapter 2 of Philippians, from verse 6, it says, this is talking about Jesus, who although being essentially one with God, what we just said at the right hand of the Father, and in the form of God, possessing the fullness of the attributes which make God, God, did not think this equality with God was a thing to be eagerly grasped or retained, but stripped himself. I want you to listen to this now. Stripped himself of all privileges and rightful dignity. So as to assume the guise of a servant, a slave. Talking about God here. In that he became like men and was born a human being. And after he had appeared in human form, he abased and humbled himself still even further. The Afrikaans Bible said himself, and carried his obedience to the extreme of death, even the death of the cross. Now, you want to talk about limitation. You want to talk about confinement. You want to talk about restriction. That was it right there. But now watch what happens. From limitlessness to limitation to limitlessness. Watch. Therefore, because he stooped so low, God has highly exalted him <laughs> and has freely bestowed on him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, and it says in the Amplified, must bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue frankly and openly confess and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. God in human form. God who walked the earth for that period of time to redeem us to that place of limitlessness. On the inside of you this morning, there where you are seated in your home right now, on the inside of you, listen carefully to these words. You are limitless. I said to the Afrikaans people this morning, listen, from this sermon onwards, from here onwards, thou shalt have no more limitations upon thyself. <laughs> Old King James. Stop the limitations. Get into it. And it's amazing how when you do something for the first time, how you start living and reveling in it, and how you realize that the potential has been put on the inside of you to do it. I want to ask you which dreams are still alive on the inside of you. What vision has God given you? Where are you focusing? What are you looking at? We looked at that vehicle last, the gospel vehicle last week, and I praise the Lord for Annabelle who put that little full, full, Volkswagen on social media with the dust coming out. That's what we're talking about. Are you moving forward? In the times we are in now, we need the army of God and we need you with everything that you've got on the inside of you because the seeds has been planted on the inside of you. The fruit must go back to the kingdom. To the young people, I want to talk to you. Shanae and all of you young people, listen carefully. But God in your geplanted. Leave the date. Start now where, are you, where you are young. Don't wait until later. But they been in your geplanted. Begin dit uit leef vir hom. It is awesome. It is so fulfilling. So, are you going to do it? I love the Nike thing. Just do it. There are some things that, that I'm tackling right now, guys. That's good what I know on park. That, uh, I, 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 I don't know. I'm doing it. And I'm starting it. It's a lot of work. I've got to expand my, my, my knowledge. 
I've got to get much broader, wider understanding, deeper, deeper. Uh, uh, um, what is that word? Um, not just wisdom, insight. I need insight into the subject that I'm busy, two of them actually that I'm busy studying. I need a lot of help from God, but I'm doing it. Don't stop at where the world says your limits are. Break through it. Are you ready to pray with me? If you're ready to break out of limitations and out of boxes today, raise your hands to him, please, because it's him who does it. No man can do it for you. Only God can do it. Only God can do it. Father, I thank you this morning in the mighty name of Jesus for God's people. Father, I thank you for these beautiful people, friends, brothers, sisters, family of God, that today after the sermon, as we said in the Afrikaans service, after the sermon, now you read this, what will our excuses be? Will we take the seed that have been planted in fertile soil, rise up from that place where the sun shining upon us, the sun, the light of the S-O-N, the son of God, and the watering of the Holy Spirit of the seeds that have been implanted, that we produce fruit for the kingdom. Even our natural abilities. Father, I pray, I just sense it now. I pray for natural abilities that people already have for that to be enhanced and expanded. For it to grow to the place that they're going to be surprised themselves of what's been produced through their hands by what you put there. Because it's you, Father. And we are careful. We will always, always, always never give any glory to any man. Only God gets all the glory, praise, adoration, and thanksgiving. I just sense the Holy Spirit wants you to pray this with me. Those of you who want to do this, there are no obligations. You don't have to. Those of you who feel it on the inside, that you want to have a turnaround, a pivotal point in your life from today onwards, with light shining upon the path that God has given you potentially, let's do it. Say this with me, Heavenly Father, I come before you this morning in the name of Jesus. And I thank you that I learned again today that you are limitless. Please forgive me for limiting the Holy One of Israel. Forgive me, Father, for walking in self-restricted limitations. Help me to start walking by faith in everything that I do and think. Father, for your word says, you take no delight in those who draw back. I will not draw back. I am moving forward. I press towards the mark of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And Father, I pray this this morning in Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Praise the year. Praise the Lord, guys. It was awesome to have you online with us. You must have an awesome day. Unfortunately, there will be no prophetic service this evening because of my wife's um, birthday celebration, but we will see you next week, Sunday, eight o'clock, nine o'clock. Looking forward to seeing you. We love you guys. You are valuable and precious. See you later. God bless.